Okay, welcome to the final session of the 2022 NADP Fall Symposium. My name is Ryan McCammon. I haven't had a chance to introduce myself in the last couple of days because I haven't been a I haven't had a, had a talk to give, so here I am talking. Um, I am the uh, Bureau of Land Management representative to NADP. We have a handful of sites in Wyoming, Colorado, and Alaska. And so just because I'm curious, raise a hand. How many are going on the field trip tomorrow? Oh, right. Outstanding. Cool. Um, so I do have, we, um, we're, we're tag teaming it here. So Colleen, or Colleen's gonna take the first three and I'll take the last three, but welcome to the final session of this year's symposium. And it is advances in atmospheric chemistry and deposition modeling and critical loads. Okay, thanks everybody. Just seconding Ryan's welcome. Um, you may remember me from earlier today. Um, my name is Colleen Boblitz. I'm an EPA postdoc. And our first speaker for this session is Nathan R. Pavlovic from Sonoma Technology. All right, good afternoon everyone. Last session of the day and of the conference. So uh, congratulations to everyone for uh, making it through here um, and hopefully um, I'll have some interesting things to share for those of you who have stuck it out. Um, so today I'm talking about um, some very recent work that we've done developing um, empirical critical levels of ozone for U.S. tree species, um, along with their uncertainty using uh, some machine learning methods that we developed uh, to look at these relationships. Um, and I'll just start off by acknowledging uh, my, um, my collaborators on this work, including uh, Changxi Chang, Justin Coughlin, Joey Huang, Ken Craig and Charles Scar Scarborough at Sonoma Technology, as well as Kevin Horn, uh, Charlie Driscoll at Syracuse, and Jeff Herrick for, um, for their contributions to this work. So the motivation for our efforts here is really that we know that there are, um, there are impacts of ozone on, uh, on vegetation, and, and this occurs through ozone exposure um, entering tree leaves, um, through stomatal conductance, uh, impacting the plant physiology, um, then impacting tree leaves, including through foliar injury, and then cascading on to impacting uh, plant growth, and ultimately um, having large-scale, potentially having large-scale ecosystem um, effects. And um, so there's a, a value known as a critical level that is def defined as the level of ozone exposure at which a harmful effect occurs. And understanding where that, um, what value of ozone exposure um, it causes that harmful effect is very important for uh, management questions and understanding things like um, secondary standards. So we know that trees experience biomass um, loss and some increase in mortality due to ozone exposure, um, but quantifying these values um, is an important and challenging question. Um, recently, the EPA, so in the most recent um, integrated science assessment, EPA um, introduced a new causality determination for the ecological effects of ozone, um, specifically for tree survival. And um, so there's there's the robust understanding that from seedling experiments that um, exposure to ozone has an impact on reduced tree growth. But this finding related to tree survival is relatively new um, and is still in the likely causal um, level. And so there is, um, in, in, the, in the surveys about what we understand around this relationship between ozone and tree survival, um, we know that there's, there's some relationship there, but, but there's more to be done to quantify that. Um, that likely causal determination came primarily from uh, Dietz and Moorcroft's 2011 paper, um, which, which um, developed some relationships between um, annual mortality probability and ozone concentrations. Um, but those are for a limited number of trees, and the uncertainty of those relationships hasn't been um, fully assessed. And so in uh, Grilke and Heath's review in 2020, there's a conclusion that um, additional evidence is needed to um, understand uh, with more detail what that relationship between ozone and tree mortality is. Um, and so we saw this as an opportunity to take some, some recent work um, that we published earlier this year um, using machine learning techniques to uh, develop out the relationships between um, environmental exposures of trees and tree growth and survival. Um, so the, the original work that we had done looks at the relationship between tree growth and survival 
um, and nitrogen and sulfur deposition. And we found that um, these relationships do exist and um, quantified the uncertainty around um, those critical loads of nitrogen and sulfur. And so we said, well, okay, we have an opportunity here to use a similar technique to understand how, um, how ozone has an impact on these same um, ecological endpoints. And so using the um, U.S. Forest Service Inventory and Analysis National Program Database, FIA, which is uh, similar to the same database that was used in the Horn 2018 analysis for nitrogen and sulfur, um, we were able to get an updated version of that data set for January 2021. Um, and so this includes some additional tree observations um, for tree growth and survival for about 100 uh, tree species across the United States. Um, to support the analysis, we use this data set uh, along with temperature, precipitation, tree height, basal area, above ground biomass, and years elapsed, which is the same as um, has been used in the previous analysis um, led by Horn. Uh, but we augmented that data set with uh, annual W126 ozone exposure, uh, soil characteristics including the percent of organic matter, pH, and percent clay and uh, Palmer Drought Severity Index, which were some key variables that we had identified that likely also influenced both um, tree growth and survival directly, but also might mediate the effect of ozone on, on trees. And so would be important to include in a model um, to look at ozone impacts on those tree species. So I'll talk a little bit more about ozone W126. I think probably people are generally familiar with this, this metric. It indicates the cumulative exposure to ozone over time of the, the trees uh, that we were studying here, and it's calculated as the sum of the weighted hourly concentrations over 12-hour uh, daylight period during the three months of summer. And so we calculated this on an, on an annual basis and then calculated the mean W126 across the um, full time period of observation from the first observation to the last observation of each individual tree in the FIA data set. And uh, those results uh, are shown in the, in the map here on this slide. Uh, and the main takeaway here is just that, you know, in general, the W126 ozone for the trees that we're looking at in this work falls between um, 1 and 20 parts per million hours. Um, and really, that's probably more like 1, 1 to 15, the, the 20 values there. Getting up to 20 is fairly uncommon. But we do get some, some very high values even up uh, above 50 for some trees in our data set, especially in the sort of Southern, southern California um, and Southwestern United States region, but also in selected locations in the, in the Eastern United States. So we use this data set as an input to our machine, machine learning methods, um, which develop, uh, uses a machine learning method to develop uh, the relationship between ozone exposure and tree growth or survival. So essentially we're using this machine learning modeling to develop dose response curves between, um, between exposure and tree outcomes. And so um, we use the, the data set to develop a model, and then we use sampling with replacement to develop um, 600 bootstrap members, um, each with its own critical load that's calculated from that bootstrap. And then we use the results of those bootstrapping exercises to develop the uncertainty bounds around um, our critical level for ozone. Um, a little more detail on, on the specifics of the machine learning modeling method. Um, we used a model that's called XGBoost. This is a tree-based uh, machine learning model. And I don't, I'm getting a little bit of feedback. I don't know if anyone else is able to hear that. Is there? Okay. Thank you. Um, so uh, we use a, a, the model called XGBoost. This is a form of gradient boosting machine learning. You build decision trees sec that sequentially predict the residuals of the previous tree and um, the result is a, is a surprisingly good predictive model uh, for regression or classification. Um, this is a widely used algorithm in data science tasks in general, and typically when it's used head-to-head -head against other types of regression models, shows better performance than, um, than other models that have been, been used. And so we use that, um, that model, and we selected that model for the use in, in our techniques as well. Um, so we, use, we train an individual model for each of the 108 tree species in our data set to quantify um, that relationship between ozone and tree growth or survival. And then we use the, the resulting dose response curve, um, which I've got an example there on the right, to 
estimate a critical level for ozone based on the point along which along that curve at which a 1% drop in tree growth or tree survival occurs. Um, and then we use the bootstrap result for those critical levels to estimate the uncertainty around that, those critical levels. Um, so we chose a machine learning approach here um, for a number of reasons that were appealing for the development of these critical levels. Um, one is that it doesn't rely on parametric assumptions, so we can have um, uh, step functions, we can have um, variable interactions in the model, that, um, that might uh, better capture the, the, the full types of responses that you would expect to see um, between ozone and uh, tree growth or survival. Um, machine learning also has, uh, in recent years, developed, the field has developed out um, model interpretation techniques that are useful um, for understanding the relationships within a model. So traditionally, we think about these models as sort of a black box. It's hard to understand what's going on in there. And these model interpretation techniques allow us to start pulling out, okay, what are the drivers for a particular outcome? How did um, one variable influence um, the response, uh, for example, to ozone in our, in our trees? Um, and then the uncertainty methods using the bootstrap approach was also um, useful for uh, our purposes. So the first thing that we did was look at how the performance of these um, models that were predicting tree growth and survival um, compared to the previous generation of models that we had trained using an identical data set to what was used in the HORN um, 2018 model. And so in our previous work, we had seen about a doubling of improvement in the R-squared values for the tree growth models um, in the machine learning model versus the HORN model, um, indicating that we were better capturing the full range of um, influences and relationships that um, lead to a tree growing or not, or a, tr a tree surviving or not. Um, and uh, this latest iteration then shows a, an, in, an additional improvement, improvement in performance, although albeit more limited, um, with generally higher R-squared for our gross models and general, um, generally higher AUC, the area under the curve, which is a metric of a performance of a binary classifier, um, which uh, also shows improvement in our current generation of models. And so using this approach, we were able to quantify um, the critical level for ozone for um, each one of the tree species in our input data set. And those are visualized here on this graph um, in text that's probably far too small for you to read. Um, but <laughs> the main takeaway here is that um, our critical levels in general fall around um, 5 to 15, up to 20 um, parts per million hours of w, ozone W126 um, for both tree growth and tree survival, and that the uncertainty of these critical levels is, um, is moderate, you know, around the range of um, 10 parts per million hours for most of these tree species. But we do have some, some tree species on the left side of the, the graphs that show generally very low uncertainty, and then some, um, some species on the right side of the graph with, with very high uncertainty as well. Um, so one of the things that we wanted to understand is whether there was a relationship between these critical levels for tree growth and survival. You might expect that there, there would be, and, and also whether there was a relationship between the um, trees that have high uncertainty for tree growth and tree survival. And so we just plotted um, here on the x-axis the critical levels for ozone impacts on growth and then for ozone impacts on survival on the y-axis. And we find that the, there doesn't appear to be uh, much of a relationship at all between these two um, critical levels. Um, we also, on the right, looked at the size of the confidence interval for these critical levels, and we do find for a couple of species, we have very high uncertainty, white fir um, and canyon live oak, and that's for both, um, both types of critical levels, um, and, but then for most of the others, we don't have a, a strong relationship there as well. So um, that was a bit of a surprise to us, but, um, but we um, don't think it's outside of the realm of what, what could be possible. Um, the Statistics at the, on the bottom are just the aggregate statistics across all of our um, tree species. So the median critical level for 1% uh, drop in tree growth or tree survival probability. Um, and so the median there for growth is um, 11, around 11 uh, parts per million hours and for survival uh, also around 11.5 11 11 um, parts per million hours. Um, you do see that there's the uncertainty range. So the minimum and maximum does cover more 
uh, a broader range of um, ozone exposures that we thought might then translate into um, seeing generally higher uncertainty in the survival critical levels than in the growth critical levels, but um, again, we did not see that in our results. Um, so this is just a, a couple of examples of tree species that we've taken a closer look at, um, and this shows the dose response curves that we've developed for, um, in this case, quake, uh, quaking, in this case, quaking aspen. Um, and so we have uh, the survival probability on the top and the growth probability, uh, growth rate on the bottom. Um, you can see that the survival is is a fairly flat curve here, um, whereas the growth rate we see a pretty strong. Um, decline in the growth rate between about 5 and 15 um, parts per million hours. Um, the blue bars in this plot indicate the um, uncertainty bounds of the critical load that we, uh, the critical level that we've calculated here. And so you can see for this this species, we do have higher uncertainty for the survivor probability than for the growth rate um, critical levels. <coughs> and that's illustrated there. Similarly, for ponderosa pine, um, we saw a relatively flat survival probability uh, curve. We were able to calculate a critical level um, for, for that species, but um, it's generally pretty high and, um, and relatively uncertain, whereas here again, um, the growth rate, rate declines with increasing ozone W126. Um, Western white pine illustrates a, um, something that we're working on understanding uh, better in our results. Um, for the survival probability here, we actually see a, an uncertain but still an increasing relationship between ozone and survival probability at low concentrations of ozone. And so one of the things we're trying to understand is why we're, why we're seeing that kind of relationship. Um, and it may be, um, may be related to some correlation we have with um, nitrogen. And so we're, we're trying to understand that a little bit better. Um, but nevertheless, we have um, declining, uh, declining growth rates for the species as well as ozone concentrations increase. The last thing that we um, wanted to look at here was how these um, results compare to um, previously reported values in the literature. Um, we took a look at a number of papers that have tried to understand or quantify um, how ozone uh, exposure impacts um, tree species, primarily um, tree growth. Um, and so we looked at the papers shown here. Most of these didn't report a value that could be directly compared to our 1% um, critical levels. And so um, it was a little bit hard to interpret, but we did have uh, the Lapina paper from 2016, which um, reported some curves that we were able to use to calculate that 1% reduction. Um, for ponderosa pine and for aspen. And then uh, there's a paper, which we haven't actually included in this table, um, for Lee 20, uh, from Lee uh, in 2022, just earlier this year. Um, and that one had 16 tree species where we had a um, critical level that we could calculate. And so, uh, and those values are shown here on, on this larger table. Um, so we were interested to see how do our um, critical levels compare to what, um, what had been found there primarily um, from these seedling studies uh, that, that Lee went back and reanalyzed. Um, and what we find is generally these machine learning um, critical levels uh, that we've calculated are higher, even, um, you know, that fall above the one-to-one -one line um, between Lee reported values or Lapina reported values and what we have, um, even when you take into account the uncertainty in the, in the critical levels in our results. And so there's some, some thoughts about why that might be. Um, one is that um, in the literature in general, the, there's been some indications that um, uh, seedlings, which is what have been used to generate the literature reported values here, may be more sensitive to um, ozone exposures. They may have um, higher stomatal conductance in general, so a given ozone exposure would cause a higher um, you know, reduction in growth. But there may also be um, uh, other factors there, uh, for example, the correlation with the nitrogen question and whether that's playing a factor in this could cause our um, critical levels to, um, to be higher than what we have here, uh, or there could be some other things going on there. So um, definitely something we want to understand better, but nevertheless an interesting um, and I think useful um, result to, to have here. 
So just to go ahead and wrap up, um, our uh, modeling efforts here using machine learning to understand the relationship between uh, ozone exposure and tree growth and survival um, has generally, um, including these new covariates, has improved the performance in the model over our previous approaches. Um, the ozone critical levels calculated with our method um, did vary significantly across species, but generally fell between zero and 20 parts per million hours. Um, and for the comparison with, with previously reported values for critical levels, um, our results are generally higher, uh, show higher thresholds than, um, than what had previously been um, reported. So a couple of future directions we want to take this work in. Um, first is, again, understanding that interaction with nitrogen. Um, also, we want to understand whether these are, you know, whether there's anything useful in here to, to, to understand about extrapolating um, results from these seedling studies, which are generally um, what we have available to understand this relationship, um, and applying it to full population, tree population, um, and mature trees like we have in the FIA data set. Um, we also then want to assess cases where there, we have that relationship of increasing growth or survival with increasing ozone. That's an important piece to, to pick, pick apart. And then um, contextualizing the critical levels um, within recent ozone concentrations to understand where exceedances of those critical levels are currently occurring would be a, would be a final next step. So um, I'll just wrap up by acknowledging um, we've had some conversations about this with Chris Clark as well, and so appreciate his contributions. And uh, this work has been supported by the Electric Power Research Institute. And uh, there's the references. Thank you very much. OK, thanks so much, Nathan, and right on time. Um, so are there any maybe quick questions for Nathan? OK, Linda? Oh, oh sorry, Mike. Um, oh, yeah, sorry. one. Uh, can you use machine learning to assess community dynamics? Like, does a species respond more to ozone with species X or species Y presence as well? We could look at that. Our, our models currently, we just have an in, independent model for each one of our tree species. And so I don't think we have the structure built up yet to be able to do that. But I think it would be. Um, We'd want to think about what indicator are we are we just including every tree species in there, or do we have some you know some summary statistic for what community composition is? I think we'd have to think about what the structure of that would be, but I think we definitely could think about a machine learning approach that would look at that. Great uh, talk, thank you. Uh, I was thinking about the FIA tree data, and they do uh, apportion the data by tr by uh, diameter. So you could possibly take out a very young cohort to look at if you wanted to get something a little closer to seedlings. Just take the one to, I think it's one or two, one to two inches or something like that. You could perhaps get some of the separate the younger cohort from everything else. Maybe you've already done that. Or no, we haven't. That. It's a it's a great idea. Okay. Um, we do have we have that diameter information in the in the data set. So mm -hmm. thank you. Okay, great. And so um, for uh, our next talk, our next speaker is um, Dr. Kiran Alapati from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Good evening. I would like to thank uh, NEADP folks for giving me an opportunity to share our recent works uh, with all of you. Um, I would like to thank my co-authors, uh, especially um, Jesse Bash, who has been a tremendous help to me and other team uh, in accomplishing this work. So, in regards to uh, dry deposition for gases and particulate matter or aerosols, um, there are three components, at least uh, the major ones, um, aerodynamic resistance, boundary layer resistance and overall surface resistance. Uh, in terms of uh, aerodynamic resistance, um, there are several stability correction methods are used, and depending on what model you use, uh, these different stability functions or correction methods uh, causes differences among the model uh, calculations. And in terms of boundary layer resistance, 
It's usually called quasi-laminar memory layer resistance, but it's not really quasi-laminar for certain conditions. So uh, this kind of resistance, resistance is underrepresented. Uh, the, basically, the turbulent strength is underrepresented in terms of formulations. So uh, in many models, if not all, uh, F impacts of the dew formation and stoma uh, blockage by particulate uh, PM deposition is not accounted for. Uh, in, in terms of particulate matter uh, PM deposition, turbulent strength, you know, is not just uh, simply, a, you know, uh, it is uh, not well represented in many models, such as the friction velocity is used. So these are the components uh, of the, uh, the work we have been doing. Um, coming to the quasi-laminar boundary layer resistance, uh, long time back there has been several experiments where they showed um, impacts of the daytime heating or summertime, where this is a snapshot of the photograph, you see the convective plumes moving away from the leaf there under calm and windy conditions. Um, there are other, uh, other studies focusing on this one, but the current formulation does not take uh, consideration uh, these effects in these models. So the overall objectives are propose and evaluate a new 3D turbulence velocity scale that does not have any explicit dependence on uh, you know, stability function, something like that, and introduce such a velocity TV, turbulence velocity parameter, to several resistance formulations in the dry deposition. Um, like I earlier mentioned, we are introducing dew formation and its impact on the resistances and of course, PM deposition. Uh, we also have introduced one new cuticle uh, resistance formulation that has more degrees of freedom. And basically, we want to compare these uh, existing formulations with these uh, updates. Um, I have, since these are actually, these are two papers slammed together <laughs> to fit it in 15 or 20 minutes. So I'm going to zip through uh, some of these slides. At least uh, it will give you a flavor on what are the new advances we have brought in here. And these two papers are in press as of last night. Um, so they are, they are available online. So if you want to find details, you're welcome to look at those papers. So basically what we are doing in first part is get rid of these stability correction, correction uh, terms so that one velocity scale will be useful for all stability regimes in the boundary layer. We start with the TKE, which is turbulence kinetic energy. Uh, it is equal to E prime square, that equal to half of the um, U prime square, V prime square, and W prime square. These are the velocity fluctuations. So in terms of standard deviation or velocity variances, you know, this also can be re rewritten as sigma square three components. So if you sum up all these things we call, and the square root of that one, we call it a turbulence velocity scale. So if you look at the Harvard Forest site, they have measured for the past four decades, sigma u, sigma v, sigma w, and these can be used to develop a uh, parameterization for E star. Uh, of course, they also measured the friction velocity, which I call it as u ops. Um, so the closer problem here is how to estimate or parameterize the E star. Since we have the observations for decades, uh, in my previous life when I was a full-time uh, full uh, scientist, uh, I developed a boundary layer scheme and then later on I moved on to administrative jobs anyway. And then recently uh, my postdoc and I developed one equation for E star for convective conditions and stable conditions and for neutral conditions. But we never had an opportunity to validate this one uh, with the measurements. That's what we did here. So if you look at the uh, 3D sonic anemometer data for this one about decade, the x-axis is the measured uh, or 
E star absurd, and the y axis is parameterized based on those equations. You can see an excellent correlation there. Uh, R squared is 0.96 almost. We were really surprised by this one. But nevertheless, uh, uh, this parameterization opens up a new avenue here for modeling turbulence uh, effects on the, you know, uh, for the tide deposition. So, since you know E star, you know it contains normal stresses, we can use it directly uh, as a shear stress. So we were looking around what constant we can hit it with to get uh, comparable friction velocity, which is on the x-axis here. There is a 3D sonic anemometer friction velocity that includes the impacts of the buoyancy production or vertical heat flux, whichever it is. And then K times E star has provided a good scaling for this. So if you have a 3D sonic anemometer measurement for friction velocity, you can calculate, actually you can replace it with the K times, K is one common constant multiplied by E star, either parameterized or from the, from the instrument. So that is a really a, you know, a dramatic result to be found uh, from this study. So if you want to look at how for a decadal period, this variability uh, uh, between the observed and the parameterized friction velocity, they go reasonably well uh, for a given parameterization that is not, it's not uh, uncommon to have that kind of diff minor differences. So the first part of the study is uh, to take this E star, which is uh, uh, applicable for all conditions in the band layer. It's, this is Jesse uh, the model. Uh, of course, others have contributed to it, and earlier Colleen has described the model. It was helpful, so I took out some of the slides. <laughs> and Jesse is going to show more, so you'll get more dose of that one. So basically, here we are taking out that U star and then replace it with uh, K times E star. And these are the equations for various resistances there. The red color indicates the new terms there. And also, the new cuticle resistance has more degrees of freedom, including the intensity of the turbulence, IT, which is the E star, the new velocity scale divided by wind speed, and so forth. And we are using some simple uh, constants here for this study to change the stomatal conductance because particle blockage causes the stoma to close, so that has impacts on the conductance. Uh, and of course, dew and together with the PM has impacts on the photosynthetic Act two radiation also. So there are a lot of papers on those things. So this is the stage model uh, I'm using, and the modified or branched part of this code is called TV stage, uh, turbulence velocity based stage. Um, so, I'm coming to the main result. We have several results, uh, meteorological validation of this velocity and other stuff. Uh, it's documented in the paper. But the ozone uh, fluxes at the Harvard Forest site. You can look at the OBS is orange, and the green is the original stage, and the blue is the TV stage. Uh, both are doing well, given the situation here. Uh, but uh, because of the changes we have introduced here, particularly for the PM and DU and other uh, parameterization stuff there. So TV stage seems to be a little bit better here um, in terms of diurnal variation for the 10 years and seasonal monthly variation. So that was very uh, encouraging. Uh, the next part is extension to particle deposition. So Wesley has done a lot of work, uh, needless to say, most of you know, if not all of you. Um, one of the factors you, very, uh, that plays an important role is this uh, WF factor he has introduced a long time back, which is W star square divided by U star square. And he introduced that one to really match the model calculations with the measurements for the sulfate particle deposition. Simply using U star, it didn't work out well at all. So in RB calculation, he has that factor there. But it has been not really validated with any other, other methods or measurements. So here what we do is, since we have the turbulence velocity scale here, we define turbulence factor TF 
is, is, re, is ratio of the sigma square v and sigma square w divided by the sigma u square. And Wesley's paper was uh, really helpful to us to design these values here based on his findings. At that time, he didn't have access to those sigma values from the measurements, but we do now. So I was able to just copycat that and then put it into action there. So new TF is a little bit complicated, but uh, nevertheless, these are regular parameters that you can access to. So uh, this is sedimentation velocity, which is also called gravitational settling velocity, da, da, da. Um, it is, uh, Basically, it's a balance between the drag and the gravity, but uh, turbulence downdrafts particularly, they bring down the particles faster, and that is not accounted for. So we introduce an effective sedimentation velocity, which is the base velocity times one plus IT, and IT is the intensity of the turbulence, where this turbulence modulates the deposition, uh, the fa the, how fast the particles are settled down. Similarly, this Stokes number, these are coming from engineering. Uh, so the Stokes number also here, uh, the different stability regimes in the PBL are not reflected here really. So we have introduced that IT concept uh, and also replaced the U star with the K times E star. So that E star is applicable for any, any stability regime there. So we ended up with uh, new equations for uh, Stokes equation, a uh, Stokes number, which is called, we call it as effective Stokes number. Uh, so coming to CMAC scheme, we have also tested this kind of thing in the CAMEX model, but uh, due to the lack of time, I'm just focusing on the CMAC. On the left-hand side, you see the stability function here for REA. We don't have that stability function, but still it works good. And uh, all the red letters or red terms, red color terms, they are the new terms we have introduced into the model. So to cut the chase, I'll go to the, directly to the final uh, result. Of course, EIN interception is still zero in CMAC. We are still working on it to account for trichomes uh, that captures the uh, particles, and sometimes they release also. But anyway, that's going on. So. This is another box model. Uh, we used one case study from Japan. We have about five and a half days of data there. And some data is there is not all. No matter what experiment or field campaign you look at, there is some shortage for data, <laughs> particularly for particular uh, PM uh, size distribution or composition or boundary layer height or whatever it is. So we have to make up this PSD. Uh, we thought is the best fit here. So we are using B sections method and uh, um, the aerosol mo model uh, representation here. So the final result here is the data is available at four hours intervals. These are the medians, dry deposition velocity. The bottom line here uh, is the current uh, CMAC uh, model formulation. Ignore the red dotted line, that is for CAMEX, I don't have time to go to that. Uh, the top da uh, dashed lines, purple and teal, eh, violet and teal, uh, those are the sectional and model. Once we included all these turbulence effects, uh, it really helped to improve the model simulations for uh, dry deposition velocities for the sulfate. So I'm almost there. <laughs> so basically, <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry to rush through, but at least you got some feeling for what we have, what kind of damage we have done here. <laughs> um, so we have uh, proposed a turbulence velocity scale, you know, that has R squared of 0.96 compared to the sonic anemometer data. R squared 96 in my life, I have done a lot of statistics. I never got 96. Probably this will be the end of it. I will never see a better number than this. <laughs> Uh, and then we hypothesized and proved that uh, the measured friction velocity can be replaced by one Kármán constant with the turbulence velocity scale. And we have introduced the turbulence effects in the you know, boundary layer leaf and in canopy and RB soil and the cuticle, of course, a new formulation. Um, effects of the PM and DU are also included. So they all worked out very well. It looks like, and that's all I got today. <laughs> mm. 
Thanks so much, Kieran, for this very expansive talk. <laughs> and congratulations on your recent publications, which seem like a really nice reference uh, for if folks would like to, to go and dig a little deeper. Um, we do have a few minutes for questions. Does anyone have any questions for Kieran? I have a question. This might be a naive um, chemistry person question. Um, <laughs> Um, but um, do you anticipate, so your, um, your representation and evaluation um, of the, the VGE based on the sedimentation velocity, mm -hmm. do you anticipate that that um, representation might differ by aerosol size? Um, it's like asking whether you drop two, two different balls, right, from different heights, which one comes faster? Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, it is a small <laughs> contribution. It mm -hmm. could make some difference, but mm -hmm. it's worth looking at it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. But I don't know how much difference it makes uh, a difference or not. So, good question. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay, nice. Okay, are there any other questions for? Oh, okay, great. Jeff has a question. If you ask a question, you get an extra cookie, and they're out there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. What do I get for asking a question? <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask if you could say a little bit more about the addition of dew to the model. You know, we've done some work looking at ammonia where dew formation is really important in modulating the boundary layer concentration. Have you worked with that much yet, or what are, what are sort of the goals there? Um, in this study, to begin with, uh, what we did is we used a fraction of uh, the radiation uh, taken out from the PAR. Dew formation can be a tricky one, really. It depends on how, what model you use. There are very complicated models, actually, and sometimes they work well, sometimes they don't work well. Um, but the literature indicates Anywhere between you know few percentage to even thirty percent of the radiation will be reflected back uh, to the space. Um, that depends on the contact angle and what part of the canopy you are talking about. So it's a little complicated, <laughs> but right now we are just using a constant, very conservative value at the lower end. Um, but when Jesse and I get to the CMAC, we are going to revisit this and. We'll go from there. Great, thanks. Looking forward to seeing how that develops. Thank you. All right, I have an online question from Qian Fang. It is interesting that turbulence effects are parameterized into dry deposition scheme, which has been neglected for a long time. I think so. <laughs> well, that's good for me. <laughs> Thank you for that comment. Yes, uh, truly, when I, I'm a part-time scientist, uh, whenever I find time to keep my sanity, I do my research. So when I was looking around, everybody works on different things. Nobody is working on it. I do have expertise in TKE. I said, okay, let's give it a try. And then Jesse said, hey, here is the box model. Truly, box model was the life giver for this research. If that was not available, I would not have done this. I said, okay, move on. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thanks so much, Karen. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Our next speaker is Brett Schichtel from the National Park Service. Well, thank you very much. Um, what I'm going to be doing here is sharing with you a, a, a long and continuing journey that we're going under through it with the National Park Service and Colorado State University to better understand the contributions of agriculture to air quality issues in our national parks, but also other um, rural regions. And I, I did say we, but I'm using that very liberally because um, Gustavo um, Chukkara, who's a, uh, a postdoc at CSU, is really the one who's doing all of the work, the heavy lifting here, and many of the graphs that I'm going to be showing are the result of his work. But also, um, uh, when I wrote the abstract for this, I was very optimistic. It scares me. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> it is. I mean, it's. Okay. It's, 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 it's the online people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, well, yeah, when we wrote the abstract, I was really hoping and expecting that we would have some real results to show for you, but we hit some obstacles, and I'm going to go over some of that. So um, uh, it's going to—it's not as satisfying a presentation as I had hoped. Um, some of the background here as to why we're doing this, and I think this was covered very well by um, Meredith uh, yesterday, and that is that we're seeing this grand shift in the, uh, in the chemical composition of the reactive nitrogen being deposited. And here's some work from Yi Li back in 2016 where we saw that uh, we and many other people have shown that uh, nitrate in the bucket, NADP, has been decreasing over 20 years and you know, 30 years today. The red, we're seeing trends downward, while the ammonium, the blue trends, are all upwards. And so today, um, it's about a 50-50 split, but in many areas, at least that I'm most concerned about, the ammonium or the reduced nitrogen is what's driving this. And that's coming from agriculture, right? Uh, and I should point out here, here's our best um, total dry deposition budgets. And we're talking 60 to 75, 80% of the, the best we could do to estimate the total deposition is coming from the reduced nitrogen fraction. If we want to resolve these issues, we have to attack the reduced nitrogen fraction, and that's going to be um, ag. So the objectives, I've said all this. Uh, it's much more than nitrogen deposition. We're very interested in visibility. We're even interested in human health. Uh, dust, although the models are incapable of simulating dust, but all, we're interested in all of the um, contributions here, not just nitrogen, but I will be talking on just nitrogen. Um, going to do source apportionment. You need uh, really to identify individual source types like agriculture you have to start to um, incorporate some chemical transport models. The one we're using is CAMEX, um, Companion, to CMAC. They're very similar. We've just been using CAMEX for years, and it has really excellent source apportionment tools. So, so that's why we, uh, we use that. The inputs, the, um, the meteorology and the emissions actually originated from EPA. They were used by the Western states for their regional haze rule assessments, and so we were hoping that they were well vetted, well understood, um, but I'll show some, some issues uh, there. Uh, we, are, we did incorporate a bidirectional flux for ammonia, and this is based upon the Zhang um, mechanisms, um, really from his two, 2010 paper. Um, just have to show the, uh, the uh, agricultural emissions for ammonia. We can clearly see uh, this is fertilizer. These are uh, uh, animal, livestock, CAFOs, about a factor of four difference in the scale. Most of the ammonia is coming from the CAFOs, although there's a lot of collinearity spatially for these things. The uh, uh, Midwest, high agriculture. You've got Iowa here, a lot, uh, lot of animals, a lot of corn, et cetera. Of course, the San Joaquin Valley and our North Carolina. All these areas will, will come up again. Um, what's interesting here is that uh, if, if uh, to understand agricultural's contributions, we really need to understand most of the other important sources' contributions as well. Can't just get one. That's one of the beauties of the, uh, the chemical transport models. So we are looking at contributions from, from many different source categories. Of course, about 75% of the uh, ammonia and ammonium, the, the sum of those are coming from, um, from ag, Fire being the next largest here in 2016, that's going to vary year to year, of course. Uh, uh, mobile sources, which we keep hearing a little more about, uh, EPA is estimating that 3% in our domain, that's this box here, of the uh, ammonia, and ammonium is coming from cars. We now know from work from like Davin Henze's group, uh, Mark Fenn, that's probably underestimated by a factor of two, factor of three. So instead of 3%, it's somewhere between three and 10%. Still a much lower contribution than say ag, but it could be very important in urban uh, environments. Um, uh, okay, so the first thing we did was evaluate it, uh, the standard um, ambient monitoring data sets. I like Improve, I work on that, so we did use that a lot, but also CASNAT uh, ammonia from AMON and wet deposition of NADP. Um, 
And this is just showing some, um, some of the model versus the observed data against various um, measured constituents at the highest time resolution. Ideally, we want the model to be able to reproduce a daily um, measured value, but that's really unrealistic um, with what we're, with the systems that we're dealing with. And, you know, often we get these blobs. Uh, this is wet deposition data. So, so the, the, the way that I like to, to look at this and what I think is important is that we don't have to get the source apportionment on a day correct. We've got to get the source apportionment on a year correct. And so we don't have to reproduce the concentrations on a day. We need to get the spatial and temporal patterns correct, and we need to get the distributions right. If we can get all of that, then we've got our emissions in the right place. We've got our transport generally in the right direction. We're accounting for meteorology properly. So to look at that, and I'm just showing the NADP here, we aggregated up all of the data for 2016. So every data point is one site, one year, okay? And here we're looking at the ability of the model to reproduce the spatial patterns in the NADP data. Uh, uh, and I'll say it, it's, it's very good. To, to capture the, the seasonal data, the, 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 time, uh, the time dimension, we took um, for every week, every sample week, as each one of these dots, we aggregated all of the sites together. So this is looking at how well the model reproduces precipitation every week across the United States. And so if we take a look at the precipitation, we really have, uh, you know, I'm going to call that pretty exceptional correlation. This is precipitation. We're in, we're in rural environments. We're in complex terrain. But yet we got an R squared of 0.7. On, uh, on an annual average across the country, and you can see that we've, we're truly capturing the variability from week to week across the country. And our slope is one. So, so thumbs up, that's great. The WARF model is doing a great job. And I have looked at frequency distributions. It really reproduces the frequency distributions as well. Um, ammonium in the bucket. Similar, very good um, correlation. So we've captured the spatial patterns. We've got a slope near one, so we don't have any bias. And we're capturing the seasonal cycle, though we are low, uh, high in the summer, low in the winter. So we do have these biases, these seasonal biases that are being compensated for in here. But these type of biases need to be accounted for when we ultimately get to source apportionment. Nitrate is really interesting, excellent correlation but we're only, um, we're underestimating it, the wet deposition by 30%. We got a slope of 0.7, and you can see that we're doing it across the, the season. Uh, th this bothered me, and we looked into it a little further. So this is a similar plot. This is the, uh, the wet deposition. It's hard to see, but these are our one-to-one -one lines here. So we're underestimating wet deposition, but our nitric acid and our nitrate, it's best to look at those as a sum measured in CASNET, we're overestimating those by about 30%. Our precipitation is good. Our ambient concentrations are high. Our wet deposition is low. This suggests a problem with um, the washout mechanisms. So, so um, uh, hopefully we can talk to the CAMEX developers and see really what's going on here. Maybe it's something we did. Um, but nonetheless, these are biases that have to be accounted for in order to be able to um, report some source apportionment. Otherwise, we're going to underestimate the oxidized nitrogen and overestimate agricultural's contribution. Um, so that brings me to the source apportionment. And we are using the PSAT tools or the uh, particulate source apportionment technology in CAMEX. And that gives you the ability to, to tag a source, a source type like fertilizer or a source region or something like the boundary condition. So we're able to tag all of these different source, source characteristics. And, we, and we, 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 we tag 12, uh, fertilizer, CAFOs of course, fires, road of course, oil and gas, although that doesn't really do anything, boundary conditions and more. Um, and so this is going to be the basis of the data set that will allow us to apportion out um, ag's contribution to various air quality issues. But just as a quick back of the envelope calculation, just to, to make me feel good, um, Gustavo took the entire grid and just aggregated it up, summed or averaged over every grid cell in our 12 
um, kilometer domain, and we're doing a, a mass balance check here. Now in this domain, 70% of the reduced nitrogen is coming from ag. When we look at the ambient concentrations, this is the surface layer, we have between 35 and 48% of the um, concentrations is coming from ag. Okay, it's a little low. We take a look at the, uh, the uh, dry deposition and wet deposition, and we see that on average about 40% of, the, um, of the, the deposited re reduced nitrogen is from ag. So there's about 40% of the emissions that are unaccounted for. We don't know where this is. It could be advected out of the grid. It could be advected vertically and diluted. But why would that happen preferentially versus other sources? Our, uh, we've got a problem here, so this is what ground everything to a halt. Um, so, we, so unfortunately, the, uh, the source apportionment results here uh, are invalid, and we need to track this down. So, so we've been working on it but haven't figured it out. So not all is lost because one of the things that we did prior to this in order to get a feel for this um, uh, agricultural contributions is that we did a standard in and out run. So we have our base case simulation, what we evaluated the model. Uh, we have our agricultural emissions. We can remove those from the emission inventory. We can rerun the model, call that no ag. So base case minus no ag is an agricultural contribution. And in fact, it's the total agricultural contribution. So, so it, it's, a, it's a really valuable value. Uh, unfortunately, we only had this because it was more for diagnostic purposes for July 2016, but there's some interesting results here uh, nonetheless. Um, uh, this is showing the, the surface level concentrations of the ag contribution for, we can start off with ammonia, and you can see that the patterns in the high ammonia do mimic what we were seeing in the emission inventory, just as you would hope and you would expect. We've got our Snake River Valley. Iowa, Minnesota, North Carolina, et cetera. And you can also see that we have low contributions in the Southwest and the, the Northwest as well. It's interesting, um, you know, you, we form particle nitrate, ammonia neutralizes nitric acid and that creates particle nitrate. You need the ammonia, ammonia you need the, uh, the nitric acid. So we're seeing that ag is contributing one, two, three micrograms per cubic meter of PM 2.5 for the month of July. This is, this is not an insignificant amount. Um, and other people have shown this where ag could actually be used as a control mechanism for PM 2.5, redu reduce the ammonia. But it's interesting that it's displaced where the emissions of ammonia are here, the Ohio River Valley, coal fire power plants, industry, a lot of NOx. We see that the ag is, uh, the ammonia is getting transported into that region and that's where we're seeing the uh, contribution to part particle nitrate. And as you would expect from, if you remove ammonia, if you remove agriculture, the nitric acid, it's, ne it's a negative contribution. Nitric acid goes up, right? Uh, no mystery there. So uh, as you would expect, the model's responding uh, as we would hope. Um, so what about uh, nitrogen deposition? This is just the total deposited nitrogen, again, for July 2016. This is our base case. This is our no ag run. And so here we're looking at the agricultural contribution to the uh, total re uh, reactive nitrogen deposition. As you would expect, you go into this high intense agricultural area, 80, 90% of that reduced nitrogen is from agriculture. You go to um, Eastern North Carolina, a lot of CAFOs there, same thing. San Juan King Valley. Now, we really don't care about these areas. I care much more about Rocky Mountain, Big Bend, Greater Yellowstone area, um, Craters of the Moon here in, in uh, thanks, um, uh, in the Snake River Valley. And, and we can see that we have a high ag contributions, you know, in the, in the, in the Sierras. Uh, it's a, we really got to dig into this and, and get the, the actual values. But, but you can see that in many of these national parks, um, you know, Acadia there, we're going we're gonna to go there tomorrow, Great Smokies. We are seeing significant contributions from the ag agriculture to the reactive nitrogen deposition, at least um, uh, in, in July during the summer. But also important is that we have large swaths of the country 
where agriculture is a minor contributor to the reactive uh, reduced nitrogen. <laughs> I'm sorry, reactive nitrogen deposition, where it's, it's 10 or 20 percent. These are the places where mobile sources are going to be more important, transboundary transport, biomass burning, a lot of biomass burning in the summer 2016 uh, in the Northwest. And that's what's, that's what's probably dominating there. And once we get that PSAT data, I can tell you for sure. Um, this is uh, just showing a, a similar plot as the last one, but now we're showing the contribution to the reduced, the ammonia, ammonium. As you would expect, very dominant, oxidized. Agriculture is essentially an ins insignificant contributor, uh, at least uh, on average, to um, the oxidized nitrogen uh, fraction. And, and no surprise there, it's, it's combustion. Okay, so, um, you know, in summary, we, we've got some problems. We've got some work to do here. We're um, going to uh, uh, resolve this, and hopefully next year um, uh, Gustavo can come here and, and give you guys a, uh, uh, a nice talk uh, about what is truly contributing to the problems we have in national parks. Uh, I just dropped this in because uh, Jesse Bash is here. One of the things that we did uh, which I thought was kind of unique is that we're actually trying to track the contributions from re-emitted ammonia from the bidirectional flux. So it gets deposited, re-emitted, where it loses its source signature. So we're tracking that just to see how much of the um, uh, uh, reduced nitrogen at a site is from these bi-di mechanisms. And if you look over the domain, it's actually quite small. Uh, it's only about 3%. Um, uh, uh, and this, this is with, the, the, which was actually a surprise. I, I was expecting it to be much higher because we are incorporating um, uh, agricultural regions. Uh, and again, w this is the Zhang mechanism that has been um, uh, 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 implemented. Um, another thing for us to look at um, down the road. And with that, I can take any questions. I got two minutes. <laughs> Thanks, Brett. Does anyone have any questions? I have one question. Okay. Do that and then, mm -hmm. okay. All right, great. Here's a Zoom question from Stuart Weiss. There was a study in California, Almaraz et al., 2018, that showed an underestimation of NOx emissions from agriculture. Any evidence of that in your nationwide work? Uh, n no evidence yet. Uh, you know, that is something that we were interested uh, in investigating, the, the soil NOx, uh, actually. And uh, I'm hopeful that once we get all of this pulled together, we'll be able to do some inverse modeling. And that's how we plan on correcting some of these, these biases. And if there's a systematic bias such as that, that's also a large signal, um, we should be able to, uh, to see it there. Uh, I, I have a feeling it's going to be a small signal and we're not going to be able to pull that out. But it, it is something we're aware of and we'll look at. Thanks, Rhett. Um, I'm going to ask what's probably an obvious question you've already looked at. But with regards to the source attribution issue, like, could it have something to do with what you said about the, the bi-directional flux erasing the source? Like, if it happens within the same grid cell as your emission, like, would it not count in the deposition, maybe? So, so one of the things we are thinking about, but if, we're, if we are properly tracking the bi-directional contribution, it's only 3%, yeah. uh, which is too small to account for the, this missing mass. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much, Brett. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Ryan to introduce folks for the rest of the session, but thanks, everybody. Let's, let's keep the momentum going. We're almost there. <laughs> Three more to go. <clears throat> um, next up, we have a virtual presentation uh, from Patrick Campbell, who's associated with George Mason University and in the NOAA Air Resources Laboratory. So my question for Patrick, are you on and are you able to share your slides? I am on. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Can you see my slide? We can. It's just not in presentation mode yet. 
Let me do that. How about now? Perfect. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And good afternoon. Good evening, almost. Um, I do appreciate everyone hanging in there. I also appreciate uh, the NADP for allowing me to give this presentation virtually. So I wish I could be there. Um, this is actually my first NADP meeting. Uh, hopefully not my last. <laughs> um, I'm an atmospheric scientist and land modeler. Um, I've applied to air composition modeling or and air, 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 uh, air quality forecasting at NOAA uh, and George Mason University. And um, we at George Mason uh, University and NOAA, we're interested in better understanding the myriad of, of impacts of wildfires uh, on air pollution uh, and their health impacts, but we are becoming more interested in understanding the, I, I would say, relatively less appreciated impacts of wildfires on the subsequent deposition um, and ecosystem endpoints. So, so here I'll present on some of our work on the pronounced increases uh, in nitrogen emissions and deposition due to the historic 2020 wildfires in the Western US. And of course, I'd like to thank uh, my colleagues and collaborators at South Dakota State University for which this work would not be possible. Um, so, so due to climate change, uh, drought, fire management practices, wildfires have becoming increasingly increasing in size and potentially in severity over the past decades. Uh, this is particularly true in the Western US um, where, where overall um, these wildfire emission outbreaks can lead to extreme emissions of both the oxidized and reduced forms uh, of nitrogen compounds. And um, nitrogen emissions are of course major concerns um, uh, for air quality, uh, such as for ozone and, and fine particulate matter, but uh, for also atmospheric deposition and their consequential human and ecosystem health impacts. Um, and really overall, there's been limited, relatively limited number of studies that have been able to effectively quantify the impacts of wildfires and how they impact uh, the nitrogen cycle, uh, reactive nitrogen fluxes, and again, these, these earth system uh, endpoints. Um, for example, during the Western wildfire experiment for cloud chemistry, aerosol absorption and nitrogen, or the We Can Field campaign in 2018, uh, I think it was Lindis et al. in 2021 found that uh, nitrogen compounds um, comprise the majority, uh, the reduced nitrogen compounds comprise the majority of the total measured reactive nitrogen emissions. Um, so that's profound and, and a profound finding. Uh, and also wildfires can further alter the nitrogen cycle in soils, um, which can increase the soil emissions of, of course, those two important air pollutants from the soil, nitrogen oxide and nitrous oxide. Um, and previous studies also show that uh, there, are, there are soil nitrogen budget imbalances of around 50% following wildfires. And there's a lot of uncertainty where the other half of that nitrogen is actually even going. Um, so on the left, I show uh, the tree stoichiometry diagram, which representing uh, elemental ratios and they're associated with important ecosystem traits such as tree adaptability to stress or decomposition rates. The yellow hexagons at the top here are global change drivers such as rising CO2 and climate change uh, leading to drier and warmer conditions and also higher uh, rates of nitrogen deposition as I highlight in the red box. Um, and uh, the rectangles below uh, within the diagram represent nutrient pools and the ellipses indicate the biogeochemical chemical processes or cycles, the processes. Um, and these are strongly affected by climate and nitrogen deposition changes, uh, both which are expected to change dramatically in the future in a warmer climate and in the advent of, of potentially uh, more in, uh, frequently uh, more extreme wildfires. Um, where on the right, here I show a con an example of the contributions of wildland fires to a CMAC modeled wet deposition at the top and dry deposition at the bottom uh, for oxidized on the left and reduced nitrogen on the right. Um, and these are for an average period over 2008 to 2012 model nitrogen deposition from wildfires. This is based on Coppice et al. 2021. Um, and the domain means and ranges are shown in the bottom left of each panel where the oxidized species include nitrogen oxides, nitrate, nitric acid, 
tan and organic nitrates, and the reduced species include ammonium and ammonia. Um, and, and here we just note that if over this average period of, of the impact of wildfires, uh, it impacted nitrogen deposition amounts of over 30% of total deposition in some areas of the West, particularly from the dry deposition of reduced nitrogen species in the, in the West and in the Northwest. Um, and so but these previous studies, however, uh, of wildfire emissions and their impact on atmospheric nitrogen deposition are typically average, have been averaged over time, specific time periods. And this consists of many wildfire events uh, and locations, such as the 2008-2012 paper uh, study I just showed previously. So in this work, we wanted to really analyze um, uh, the historic 2020 wild, US wildfire season. Uh, and mainly from the uh, August complex fires, as you may know of. Uh, these were initially sparked by lightning on August 10th, uh, 2020, and they burned for over 86 days, mainly from August through October. Um, and it covered seven California counties and over 1 million acres uh, were burned and therefore known as a gigafire. And it was finally contained on November 11th. Um, where on the left, we show that the Doe fire was the main fire here. Uh, in Northern California of this complex. And there was this large jump. We're doubling from about 470 to 750,000 acres in area burned on September 11th, when it merged with the Doe fire, uh, excuse me, the Elkhorn fire to the North on September 10th. And that's when it really became this, this huge uh, uh, fire uh, complex that be became a, a gigafire. Um, so in either bottom up or top down approaches to estimating biomass burning, um, emissions. Uh, they're conventionally modeled using four fundamental parameters, uh, and that's E here is the emissions from biomass burning in some mass kilograms, I suppose, and DM is the dry mass fuel uh, combusted or burned. Um, and, uh, excuse me, yes, and so this consists of uh, three factors, A, B, and C shown here. Um, and that's the, uh, that is the A is the burned area, uh, B is the biomass density, and C is essentially the fraction of biomass consumed. Um, and then lastly, there is this F, which is a factor of consumed biomass that's released as trace gases or aerosols. Um, but this dry mass fuel, this dry mass burned is A, B, and C is a very large uncertainty um, in, our, in our models. And so um, in a way to, uh, approach this is to use a more of a top-down approach uh, to estimate the biomass burning uh, emissions from space. Um, and this, in this work, we base this on our blended global biomass burning emissions product, a really difficult acronym, GBBEPX. I'll refer to it as uh, GBX going forward. Uh, but the model community went in this direction um, really because of this large uncertainty to fuel loadings and burning. Um, and so we turned this top-down uh, approach of satellite observations of fire rate of energy uh, and not covering all the details shown here. Um, the GBX is based on really a linear relationship between uh, the fire rate of energy, um, and which avoids this complex estimate of the burned area in fuel loadings. Um, and so it's, it's a linear relationship to the fuel consumption and the total emitted fire rate of energy. Um, and this is based, uh, GBX is based on a blend of uh, both MODIS and VIRS polar orbiting satellites uh, to generate fire emissions for a number of species globally, um, shown here. Uh, at least this is for PM2.5 globally. So GBX provides these emissions daily at 0 0.1 by 0 0.1 degree or approximately 10 kilometers uh, for a number of gases and aerosols, NOx, ammonia, carbon dioxide, SO2, fine particulate matter, black carbon, and organic carbon. Also to note, uh, we use a global one kilometer uh, IGBP land cover type to stratify the land surface into tropical forests, extratropical forests, uh, cerrado woody, woody savannas, and grassland and croplands. And from these land cover types, emissions can be generated, emission factors can be generated for the different species uh, and assigned based on the quick fire emission, emissions data set or QFED from NASA. Um, and then these GBX data are further processed um, and they are prepared for model ready emissions uh, into the respective air quality modeling system, uh, which I show here next. And in this work, we use the uh, George Mason University wildfire forecasting system. Um, 
I won't go too many of the details, but uh, again, it's it's a uh, it's based uh, on an offline coupled model system, uh, which we take meteorology from the weather research and forecasting system, WARF version 4.2, and that's used to drive a chemical transport model known as CMAC, community multi uh, community multi scale quality model version 5.3.1, um, and then the bi biomass burning emissions are based on the GBX product, as I just showed. And the current model configuration in this case is 12 kilometer over CONUS with 35 vertical layers. Um, and I show on the left how this model, what this model system looks like, really a general schematic. Um, where in this case, for this work, we're just going to show a very simple two model scenario comparison where we compare the all fire case. This is the base case with all inputs plus the biomass burning emissions. Um, and then a no, a no fire case is a sensitivity with all the inputs, but uh, removing the biomass burning emissions. And then we can compare these two to compare to to evaluate or quantify the impact of biomass burning on uh, nitrogen deposition. So getting to the results, here I show a relative contribution of nitrogen emissions from the 2020 wildfires, where um, on the left, I just show here an average August through October uh, 2020 spatial mean plot of the mean FRP or fire radiative power to give you an idea of where the hotspots of these emissions were. Um, and then the NOx emissions uh, on the right side of that uh, with the largest impacts in central to Northern California from the August complex fires, uh, as you can also see from the hotspot of emissions. Um, we're on the right. Now I do show the contribution, the relative contribution of nitrogen emissions um, as a function of month. Uh, so on the x-axis is month, on the y-axis is the, is the percent contribution uh, uh, for the 2020 for both NOx in blue um, and ammonia in red. Uh, solid line is for the CONUS average and the uh, dashed line is for just the western half of the U.S. And so uh, what's clear is that the August complex gigafire significantly contributed to the total emissions um, where at its peak in September, uh, the fires contributed to up to 55% uh, over CONUS uh, and up to 83% of the total nitrogen emissions in the Western US. So it's a significant number. Um, so in summary, the August, 20, August to October 2020 giga fires significantly contributed to the total nitrogen emissions. Um, and so we also wanted to evaluate the system um, and for both for, for uh, meteorology and chemistry and also deposition. Uh, on the left, we show that the model system has a good meteorological performance. Uh, I'll leave that there. Uh, and really does fall within the benchmark criteria for the suitability of using WARF uh, or other meteorological models to drive a chemical model, chemical transfer model like CMAC. Um, where in the middle here, uh, it's just a simple spatial evaluation and overlay plot. Sorry if it's a bit difficult to see here. Uh, for the fine particulate matter, uh, PM 2.5 concentrations against the US EPA, CSN, and improved networks. Um, and really, this good, we, we can note this good spatial performance of the, the higher PM 2.5 across these Arcus complex fire regions, uh, with some indication of, of an overprediction from the CMAC model, overprediction of magnitude. Um, we're on the far right. And while subjected to certainly a higher uh, measurement uncertainty, there's simple regression evaluation of the simulated dry deposition of nitrate on the top uh, and ammonium on the bottom uh, shows shows really a, a really a good or a de decently good correlation. Um, again, some indication of uh, some over predictions, but the correlation uh, is actually quite good. So uh, overall, we would say that, that our model system has a good performance, can capture the meteorology and generally the large scale transport. Uh, and deposition during the fires. Um, and so since this course this is an NADAP meeting, I would be remiss to not show some simple comparisons, at least of our model simulated annual 2020 total wet deposition um, of the nitrate ion on the left and the ammonium ion on the right, uh, where overall our model system had quite good, good performance generally and generally captures the overall wet deposition spatial distribution uh, for the 2020 year. So they gave us some more confidence that we're capturing the overall wet deposition well too. Um, so getting into the, the highlights of the results though, um, here we show the, are gonna show the impacts of the 2020 September biomass burning emissions on nitrogen deposition. Um, and in the no fire case on the top, 
Uh, most of the higher nitrogen deposition uh, is in the central and then in, in the central valleys in the Southern California. Um, and so the, on the left side here is the uh, oxidized total deposition, uh, total nitrogen deposition in the middle is the reduced and then this is the total oxidized plus reduced uh, nitrogen deposition. Um, where in the no fire case, most of this is, is dominated by dry deposition of nitric acid, uh, vapor and ammonia in different regions, such as downstream of the urban centers, uh, and also, of course, in the San Joaquin Valley. Um, however, when we look at the all fire minus no fire case, essentially the contribution from the biomass burning, the contribution of the biomass burning emissions leads to significant total uh, wet plus the dry oxidized and reduced nitrogen deposition in areas outside of uh, the typically high nitrogen deposition areas that we see in the no fire case, um, where the increases in in total nitrogen deposition uh, in the Western US half this domain is about an average of factor of two. Um, it doesn't seem that significant, but it, but it actually is, where, where if we look at the grid cell average, uh, there are areas of increased deposition of a maximum of about 91 uh, kilogram per hectare uh, for total September 2020. So that is significant uh, contribution. Um, and lastly, we assess the implications of this wildfire enhanced nitrogen deposition uh, for different California ecosystems. Uh, in, compare, in particular, comparing the ratio of the total nitrogen deposition to a low end, rather conservative critical load, um, which I have here masked essentially by the major vegetation types in the model uh, in California shown on the left. Um, where again, we, we, we've heard a lot about critical loads, but we note that the critical loads are thresholds of atmospheric deposition below which harmful effects, ecological effects do not occur. Um, and in this case, we compare it to a low end average uh, critical load of three kilogram per hectare per year. Um, this is based on past literature of the critical load and effects of nitrogen deposition on major vegetation, including mixed forests in California. Um, and so while we note that there are numerous areas uh, still above, above the critical load in the no fire case on the left, uh, when we include the biomass burning emissions uh, in the all fire case on the right, the average ratio doubles about four times as large with a maximum of 37 times the critical load from nitrogen deposition uh, in the downstream regions of these, of these major August complex uh, wildfires. Um, and then when analyzing different specific vegetation types, um, on the right, we can see that for the mixed forest types only in red here, highlighted in red box, um, the average nitrogen deposition rate increases from 6.2 to 16.9 kilogram per hectare per year. Um, and that's a ex extremely large increase of about 173% uh, due to the biomass burnings. Uh, and such large nitrogen deposition due to extreme biomass burning emissions are much larger than the critical uh, the conservative low end critical load, uh, about six to 12 times larger, and certainly can affect uh, and have, uh, you know, um, uh, adverse nitrogen deposition effects across large areas of these lichen uh, organism communities found in California's mixed forests, uh, mixed conifer forests. So, so in conclusion, um, the August 2020 gigafire has contributed up to 83% at least in our analysis of the total nitrogen emissions in the Western US, um, where these extreme biomass burning em emissions led to uh, a 78% relative increase in, in annual average nitrogen deposition to the major vegetation types in California. Um, and then when looking at specific vegetation types, the relative increase in nitrogen deposition was even larger to, to mixed forest only in California at 173% with annual average deposition rates uh, at about six to 12 times larger than the low end uh, critical loads. Uh, you can find more details in our recent paper in Science of the Total Environment shown here. Um, and I think I'm out of time. Uh, I thank you for your attention and I'll take any questions. I think we have time for one quick question. Any online questions?
Um, all right, another Zoom question from Stuart Weiss. These signatures appeared in TDEP for 2020. Remote areas in California near fires had high deposition. Can we rely on TDEP to capture this effect? Um, if I understand the question correctly, um, I would think we can rely on the total deposition to capture to capture the effect. Uh, I might, maybe I don't understand the, the question 100%. Um, maybe you can elaborate a little further for me. <laughs> Uh, I did. I did. You know, again, I did look at again the 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 dry and versus dry and wet deposition. If that's what you're looking at, that you're referring to. Hey, Patrick. Any other follow up? You can just uh, circle back on chat. I yeah, will say this: you've, you've successfully married two of my passions, meteorology and wildfires. When I was employed with the National Weather Service, I, I was the fire weather dude at several of our offices. So thank you. <laughs> no problem. I think it's a relatively unappreciated effect that we're looking more into. Thank you. You betcha. Thank you. Up next, from a place not even 45 minutes from my home base in Cheyenne, Wyoming, we have Jeff Collett from Colorado State University. Great, thanks, Ryan. Um, what a great meeting, uh, and a lot of great science and discussions this week. Thanks especially to the organizers, to our conference chair, and all of you that put together sessions. Um, I'm gonna talk to you a bit about some of the work we've been doing, trying to better understand the fate of ammonia emitted from urban and agricultural sources as it's transported to and deposited in Rocky Mountain National Park. In particular, thinking about the bi-directional nature of exchange of ammonia with different ecosystems along that transport path. I'd like to start by acknowledging my co-authors, in particular, uh, Da Pan, a postdoc in the group, and Lily Namey, a PhD student who did a lot of the field work that I'm going to present. Uh, John Walker, who's sitting over here, who's a great partner in this study and a great mentor for some of the, the measurement approaches we're employing. And uh, also I'll point out Brett Schichtel, uh, who spoke a minute ago from the Park Service. This work was supported uh, by a, uh, uh, financially by EPA with additional support from the Park Service. And we also uh, collaborated with NEON and NOAA, who I'll mention later at some of the field sites. So just to set the stage, I think a lot of you are familiar with the, the many nitrogen deposition presentations over the years at this meeting for Rocky Mountain National Park. Uh, but here you see the, the park outlined uh, in green sitting up on top the, the Continental Divide. Um, there are not a lot of big sources close by to the west of the park where the prevailing winds come from. Um, but east of the park, which is usually downwind of the park, we have, of course, the Front Range Urban Corridor running from Denver up to Fort Collins. We have uh, a lot of agricultural operations off to the northeast, including these, these purple circles, which are uh, permit-scaled uh, uh, animal feeding operations. I've also included here oil and gas wells, which are uh, important sources in this region for VOCs and, and some other pollutants as well. Uh, most of the time, as I mentioned, the prevailing winds are coming from the northwest and we get relatively clean air in the park. Not completely clean, but certainly cleaner than compared to when we get a reversal of flow that picks up emissions from these relatively major close sources to the east. And that happens, for example, especially in the spring and the fall when we have low pressure systems moving across the southern part of the state and that counterclockwise circulation picks up these emissions, forces them up the eastern slope of the Rockies. You get that lifting, cooling uh, expansion that leads to heavy precipitation that effectively scavenges and deposits a lot of those pollutions into park ecosystems, especially on the, the east side of the Continental Divide. Um, but also in the summer in particular, you get strong uh, mountain valley wind circulations that are driven by the solar heating of the east uh, slope of the Rockies that during the daytime transports some of these emissions up into the park, whereas at nighttime we tend to get uh, downslope drainage flow bringing usually cleaner air off the continental divide back out towards the plains. So one of the things we've done in working on this project uh, 
over, over quite a long time now is to try and construct deposition budgets for different pathways of reactive nitrogen coming in uh, to contribute to the excess nitrogen deposition in the park. Uh, for example, this paper led by Katie Benedict in 2013, we put together this deposition budget. If you can't see uh, these labels, the, the biggest contributor is wet input of uh, ammonium. We then have wet input of nitrate. Uh, next up in this analysis was dry input of ammonia. And by the way, wet input of organic nitrogen, which we haven't talked about so much in the last couple of days, but certainly needs to be on everybody's mind as well. Now, how did we come up with this budget? Well, we were up in the park for a year measuring every day um, to get a full annual cycle. Um, we had direct measurements of wet deposition. And we measured every day uh, speciated gases and fine particles. Uh, we then used uh, CastNet model dry deposition velocities for things like nitric acid, fine particle species. But what did we do for ammonia? Well, we know ammonia has this bidirectional exchange. We had no way to deal with that really here. So we uh, estimated based on some field comparisons that the average dry deposition velocity for ammonia was about 70% of that for nitric acid. And we use that to construct this budget. In reality, of course, we know that this bidirectional exchange can be really important. And, and Colleen gave a great introduction to some of this this morning. Uh, thank you for saving me a little time in, in my talk. Uh, so we're, we're really interested in how this bidirectional exchange may change the, the net input of ammonia to the system, as well as the relative importance of different sources. And I'll talk more about that. Um, but for example, just to, to remind you, uh, here's a figure from a review paper by Mark Sutton showing some of the complexity of some of the interactions of ammonia with the, the canopy and the soil and the litter. Um, that, that need to be treated. Uh, Colleen mentioned this compensation point. If we have a situation where the atmospheric concentration is above the compensation point, we should expect some deposition. Uh, if the opposite is true, for example, during downslope clean flows, we might expect to see some re-emission with the rates governed by all these sort of complexities of the interactions with, with the ecosystem. So what we were really trying to do here was to address a number of questions. First of all, you might ask, well, if we were to properly account for this bidirectional exchange, how far off would the Benedict et al. sort of 70% of nitric acid deposition velocity estimate be? Um, I won't have an answer for that today, but we're working towards that eventually. Uh, secondly, if we think about these close sources to the east, which produce the highest ammonia concentrations in the park, um, do those become relatively more important because we're much more likely to have ammonia concentrations above the compensation point leading to deposition, whereas the lower concentration periods maybe are going to lead to some evasion, some emission of ammonia from the forest canopy. And then also, these sources, you know, while they're relatively close in the big scheme of things, there's a lot of ground in between these sources and the boundary of the park. Um, this includes the urban corridor, a lot of ag region, uh, and includes the foothills, some um, native grasslands, and so forth. And we wanted to understand more about the fate of ammonia as it passed over those land use types on its way to the park. So what did we do? Uh, we followed some of the approach that uh, John Walker and his team have been using a lot where we used a modified Bowen ratio method with a, a flux gradient technique to characterize the uh, deposition of ammonia. But by the way, and I won't talk a lot about that today, uh, we also were measuring nitric acid and SO2 and speciated fine particles. So we will have deposition numbers for all of these different components. Uh, in this uh, method, we rely on measuring the uh, sensible heat flux and the temperature gradient to come up with the eddy diffusivity, which we then assume is representative of the diffusivity uh, for uh, a species like ammonia as it's transported towards the canopy. 
Um, we made uh, replicate measurements at two heights, and I'll show you a picture in a minute on the tower, uh, using URG denuder filter pack sampler trains. Replicates because these gradients are relatively small a lot of the time, and we need really good precision uh, to, to be sure we can measure them appropriately. Uh, typically, we would make two daytime measurement periods, a one overnight measurement period for each day that we were in the field. Um, as I'll mention towards the end, we also have a year of uh, radiello passive ammonia data from the top of the tower above the forest canopy that we're going to use to drive a, a year-long simulation of the bidirectionally modulated deposition budget. So here's some pictures of the, the sites. Um, uh, just again looking at the map, um, we have one site on the sort of uh, eastern edge of Rocky Mountain National Park. This is actually where the Castnet, close to where the Castnet site is in the improved site. Uh, at the Neon Tower, which sits in the forest canopy, you can see a little bit here some of the, the fetch uh, looking from the top of that tower with our two heights of uh, measurements for our gradients above the canopy top. Um, and then we had quite some trouble finding natural grassland with a big enough fetch still in this urban, uh, much urban and ag influenced uh, front range corridor, but we ended up working at a site that NOAA has uh, called Table Mountain, which is a test facility for them. Quite difficult to get access, big thanks to Patrick Sheridan at NOAA who helped make this possible. Uh, so here you can see the tower there, and we also measured it at two heights there, and the, the nice grassland fetch around that. So we collected data um, during uh, the grassland site. We just finished up uh, late September. We have about four weeks of data there. This year, um, last late summer, we have about six weeks of uh, flux gradient data from the forest site in Rocky Mountain National Park. And we've started processing and looking at that. I'm not going to go into details here, but of course we need to really well characterize the uncertainty in our gradient concentration measurements. We need to look at the turbulence conditions. Uh, da did a nice footprint analysis to make sure, especially at the forest site, that we were measuring fluxes to or from the forest canopy and not a few other sort of random things that are nearby. Uh, most of the time we were, so that was good. And for this presentation, we've also identified these upslope and downslope transport periods to look at some of the differences in concentrations and fluxes. So let me share some results with you. We'll start with the forest canopy. Uh, here we have the concentrations measured. Uh, above the, the canopy there um, in Rocky Mountain National Park. And they're divided into, on the left, uh, the, uh, the downslope, and on the right, the upslope conditions. We separated these both based on local wind direction and on trajectory analysis. The results look quite similar here. Um, we see, and this is something we knew from previous measurements, that indeed we get higher concentrations during the easterly uh, upslope transport from these big sources off to the east. Uh, the big question is what happens to the deposition? And you can see that here. So now negative values are, are fluxes, deposition fluxes into the canopy. And you can see that we definitely see those deposition fluxes during the upslope, higher concentration periods. During the downslope periods, on average, we have a relatively small flux. Um, so this is kind of consistent with our expectation that during especially the daytime when we get upslope transport, more turbulence, higher concentrations, we would see deposition fluxes. For those of you that think about numbers, the average deposition flux was on the order of about 90 nanograms of ammonia per square meter per second. I think that was in the range of some of the, the numbers Colleen showed earlier. Uh, we can also look at deposition velocities from this data. So we take our measured flux, um, we divide by the concentration to get the deposition velocity. Here I've compared for you just the ammonia deposition velocity range and the nitric acid deposition velocity range. These are on the order of, of about 0.4 to 0.5 as a multiplier versus the 0.7 that we assumed in the 2013 paper. Uh, this is just for periods of 
deposition into the canopy. Uh, you can also look, for example, at one over the sum of the aerodynamic and the quasi-laminar layer resistance to compare, for example, to nitric acid. And at least on average, those values are kind of similar, which we would expect if we don't have much canopy resistance affecting the nitric acid deposition. What about the uh, grassland site? Uh, here are the results there. Again, on the left, here are the ammonia concentrations. We did not have a lot of really clear upslope periods here uh, out on the plains. Um, there's not a clear concentration difference between our trajectory accounted for upslope and downslope periods. Uh, but interestingly, we do see a difference in the fluxes between those two categories. Uh, we see deposition again in the upslope and uh, some evidence of, of evasion during the, the downslope conditions. Um, this may be driven in part by during the upslope. Perhaps we've got more turbulence, more deposition going on. We need to dig into that. Again, these data are a few weeks old and we have a lot of digesting to do. Um, when we do have uh, deposition rates uh, during the upslope, they're, they're less than half of what we saw up typically at the forest canopy in, in Rocky Mountain National Park. So where do we go next? Well, one of the things we're doing, and Dawes already started this with the Rocky data, is to use these flux measurements to uh, test and different components of some of the different bidirectional model parameterizations for ammonia. Thanks. Um, I'm not going to go into detail here, but there are a number of different parameterizations that differ in how they treat treat, for example, cuticular resistance or soil water or different things. And we hopefully can get some information about how these are working and which components are more or less important in terms of what we're seeing in the field. Um, one thing that will feed into this is we have uh, leaf, litter, and soil composition measurements that John Walker's group is uh, finishing up that will feed into these models as well. The other thing we're going to do, as I mentioned, we have these tower top year-long ammonia concentration measurements. We want to take our hopefully optimized bi dye model and combine them with these concentration measurements to come up with a better estimate of the annual flux to the forest canopy there. Uh, the green values on this plot on the left are the values from the tower top uh, from July on the left to July on the right. Um, you can see much lower concentrations in the winter than the summer, which is typical there. Um, in blue, interestingly, those are the Amon uh, nearby measurements. Um, they follow the, the same trend, not surprisingly. They're a bit different, but one is over the top of the forest canopy, whereas the Amon site is over a nearby grassland. The other thing we have from near the Amon site are continuous measurements of ammonia that tell us something about the diurnal cycle. So just a couple parting thoughts. Um, certainly our results confirm the importance of considering the bidirectional exchange. Uh, we definitely see in the park the enhancement of deposition rates during upslope transport. This likely means in the end of the analysis, the front range sources are relatively gonna be even more important than some of our previous dry deposition apportionments. Um, wildfires came up in the last talk, and we did have a period of wildfire influence with higher ammonia concentrations. Interestingly, not higher deposition. We think that may be because of the, the shading from the haze that you can see on that day, perhaps reducing some of the, the turbulent transport. Um, finally, we want to test these different model parameterizations and hopefully collaborate with our, our colleagues at EPA and elsewhere who are doing similar kinds of things. So thanks. Any questions? Another topic near and dear to my heart, upslope. Yes. <laughs> upslope flows. <laughs> we, all, we know them all too well. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, great. We're ready for the last talk. Yes. <laughs> and last but not least, Jesse Bash from EPA. Great, thanks guys. You're, um, it's like a marathon, we're almost there. 
I'm going to talk about um, the stage model, the surface tiled aerosol and gaseous exchange model with uh, long-term ozone fluxes at multiple sites. So we had at least a year and a half of uh, high quality micrometeorological um, ozone fluxes at um, eight different sites and then used um, an optimization routine to try to make the model perform better. Um, before I get started, I really need to um, acknowledge a lot of the authors here. These were um, field scientists that shared um, flux data, and that's, that's great. And there was a lot of them at, the, at um, CEH, at uh, uh, Jerusalem College, at Harvard University, um, pretty much all over the place. It was, it was really good. This is part of an ACME 4 project, and I have to thank Olivia Clifton and um, Christian Hogriff for coordinating it and pulling it all together. So yep, it's the EPA disclaimer. So, so the motivation of this is really, um, you know, uh, deposition can have a large impact on ambient concentrations as well as eco ecological functions. I don't really need to elaborate that with this group. Um, we had this opportunity with the Air Quality Model Intercomparison Initiative Phase 4 which have a website here, and they were collecting long-term ozone flux data sets as well as running multiple deposition models for a deposition model in a comparison. So, um, and see how the parameterizations of these processes impact predictive model performances. So this seemed like a good opportunity to apply the relatively uh, newer stage deposition model. It's a two-layer um, vegetation and soil exchange uh, resistance model based off of really the work of Nimitz. You've seen this figure before, but I wanna point out a couple things that I think are, are fairly relevant for, um, for this community is that we estimate the fluxes not only from the canopy, but within the canopy, and we use uh, Kirchhoff's current law that states all these in-canopy fluxes must sum up to the total flux. So it makes it very easy, even for ozone, you have a compensation point. It's just the compensation points in the leaf, the, uh, stomata on the ground are zero, but you still have an end canopy compensation point or a leaf compensation point. You can use that to estimate the flux to the cuticle or the stomata. And um, you can do a lot of algebra to optimize things and stuff. So um, the methods I was, uh, are going to use is uh, using these, uh, the stage model and um, the data sets from the ACME4 uh, model inner comparison. And then these data sets are of multiple lengths, so I didn't want like the 12 year long data set to dominate for the optimization. So I took um, equal number uh, N of 2000 subsets, random subsets from each data set to optimize the model. And then I split those into 11 different uh, groups, used 10 of them for uh, training data sets that would give me um, values and then uh, range of that values. And then the 11th was used for uh, model validation. And um, that represented between 80% of our shortest data set to 5% of our longest data set, those number of samples. And I assumed the following forms for the soil and cuticular resistance. The cuticular resistance is a, a function of the uh, plant functional type. And to represent that, I use leaf mass per area because it actually has a physiological um, uh, meaning. It's meaningful where you have the lower leaf mass per area, those are the shorter lived leaves, the thinner cuticles, and the longer leaf mass per area, you have the thicker cuticles and the longer lived leaves. And it also correlated with the fluxes, which was, which was another uh, choice for doing it. And then an exponential function of RH, um, because it's used in literature and also because it showed some response to it. Um, the soil resistance was, um, I'm assuming a constant, which isn't unusual for uh, um, uh, a model, I did not see any correlation with soil moisture, RH or temperature, so constant it was. And um, I optimized the models using the optim function in R. I used the median model bias and uh, quasi-Newton conjugate grad gradient algorithm, and then of course a tenfold cross-validation. And then once I got results, I put them into CMAC version 5.4 for a hemispheric simulation because ozone does have substantial boundary layer contributions oops, to, uh, to the domain and then ran it with the 2018 equates uh, simulations for a CONUS uh, continental US 2018 simulation at 12 kilometer grid spacing. So the model evaluation, where do we start? 
So you know, this is uh, this is where we started. The uh, the data sets. It was interesting working with these Flux data sets because it seemed like about every month working into it, I got a new data set. It's like, oh, we found an error in this data set, and then have to rerun everything. So um, initially, the model evaluation. This is the box model versus the data sets on the um, the subset, the uh, the validation data set. And initially, those. Uh, the evaluation was worse, but as the data sets got refined, the evaluation somewhat got better. So it turned out we started at a pretty good place where our deposition velocity was only overestimated by about 18%. We had a normalized median error of 60% and an R of almost uh, 0.5, and the flux was higher. And largely the flux is higher because it follows a, a diurnal pattern and a lot of um, ozone follows the diurnal pattern and it just contributes to higher uh, correlation, a lower uh, bias and a lower error overall. These are the sites. We had three grassland sites, which are actually quite different from each other. Two mixed forests, a shrubland and a boreal uh, conifer forest. So the, when I started the model optimization, one thing that I ran into rather quickly is it appeared that there was an initial, initial value problem. The model was sensitive to the initial values, and I should have seen this um, at first because your soil deposition is competing with your particular deposition. So, so what initial value do you pick? CMAX started off at this little uh, white dot here, which is not a great place. You know, there's room for improvement, but um, it wasn't too bad either, as you could see from the, the, the previous thing. So there's um, literature regarding uh, the deposition of um, ozone to wet cuticles, both for herbaceous species, largely done out of CEH recently, as well as uh, deposition to um, uh, broadleaf deciduous uh, trees. So I used um, the RH function of RH is 100, and then um, it should be that wet value as like sort of an indication of where it should be and that limited the initial conditions you choose for your soil, uh, soil resistance to be about between 500 and 300. Um, yeah, we found no relationship with soil moisture. We tried that. Um, the uh, cuticular resistance was significantly correlated with the leaf mass per area and I used the average values out of the tri-global database. So for the, uh, the species, or for the, say if it was a hardwood, uh, deciduous hardwood or a mixed forest, I would use those values um, uh, averaged from the, uh, the tri database and uh, plugged them into, uh, into the function and optimized it. So yeah, with the, uh, the optimization, you're basically following the gradient down to this minimum. This is a median absolute bias. We chose median absolute bias. We looked at mean values as well as uh, square error values. And we did, <laughs> looked at, if you looked at a square error, it just optimized to these really um, high or low uh, deposition velocities that are hard to explain. So the median seemed to, to give the most reasonable results. So with the model optimization, this is for the box model again, um, and uh, against the validation data set. Of course, if I compared it to the training data set, these values would be very, very small, but um, that wasn't the case, and we didn't want to evaluate our model against the training data set. So, um, it did improve the model. It reduced the biases by about 3% um, overall, and um, it reduced the error quite a bit, and it actually increased the correlation. So this is, this is, uh, uh, interesting. It primarily impacted the seasonality, which was cool, and the diurnal variability of the um, the ozone deposition. So I thought this was uh, this was rather encouraging. We started again. We started in a pretty good spot, and um, so this improved things um, a, a little bit. And we look at the box model results. This is uh, the ozone flux at I think it's Itiala in Finland, and the uh, original. Yeah. Oh, you can't see it. Okay. The original uh, model simulation was here to the left of the stage box model, where we're overestimating the flux at night quite a bit, and we're overestimating these afternoon values quite a bit. And with the optimized results, that, um, that improved substantially. We went from a normalized median bias of about 50%, although it looks a little bit better in this figure, to, to values more around 30%. And um, we saw improvements at generally a decrease in the estimated flux over um, uh, evergreens and an increase in the estimated flux over uh, herbaceous species. And then the results, um, 
what really changed quite a bit through this is where the, where the ozone was depositing to. We had an increase in the uh, fraction of the ozone that it was depositing to the soil and a decrease to the cuticular. And this was at Haitiala, uh, where the cuticular resistance went up quite a bit. And the, um, the overall estimated flux went down, so this to model uh, section was about the same. Now, we uh, took these results and we uh, put them into uh, CMAC and ran them for a year. And first thing I really wanted to look at was um, ozone eight hour max at AQS sites. And I have the optimized, this is for 2018, optimized stage deposition and then the um, in red. And then the uh, CMAC version 5.4 stage deposition, which is our latest version of the model, it was released um, in September, so that was pretty recent. And we see actually a remarkably similar uh, impact as we saw with the, uh, the box models. And I think this has a lot to do with having such a long period of, uh, a long time series of the deposition, as well as a pretty representative number of sites as far as the different land uses are concerned within the model. So we saw, um, this is surely by coincidence, but a 3% reduction in the bias, which was the same as we saw in the uh, training data set, and an increase in the correlation and a decrease in the error. And this re uh, results um, improved things mostly in the um, non-growing season because we were looking at non non-stomodal deposition. That's exactly what you would expect. And if we look at areas where the changes were the largest, and these were with the evergreen forests, and I'm looking at uh, AQS sites in Oregon, Washington, and Idaho, you see uh, a much larger uh, shift where you have, um, again, a reduction in, the, well, the bias is about the same in, in this particular case, but the error is lower. And the red line here shows the um, hourly values compared to against the hourly AQS values, and we're doing very well at the uh, nighttime, uh, during the nighttime periods, and maybe a little bit better during the, uh, the daytime so that's, um, that's, uh, that's encouraging. And as far as a national scale, we improved um, the correl we reduced the bias at 60% of the AQS sites and improved the correlation at almost 80% of the AQS sites. We're a little low in the West, and I think in general we're um, lacking a lot of deposition data over these uh, drier ecosystems. And if we had more data there, we could probably understand um, why we didn't improve the, um, at least the correlation and the, the error reduction in those errors as much. So finally we're at the summary and we can you know, leave this room shortly. The, um, <laughs> the stage deposition option was evaluated against multiple field scale flux observations that spanned uh, multiple years. An optimization routine was developed to estimate cuticular and soil resistances. Actually, it could be easily adapted to estimate really any um, uh, variable within the model because it's how the model is structured. And um, the uh, optimized resu resistances reduced both bias and error in box model and regional scale applications of the CMAC model. And similar results were apply, uh, similar results were found in, in both, which I think is, uh, is quite encouraging. We found no um, uh, ozone deposition uh, dependence on soil water content for the, the soil sites, which is similar to some um, other fairly recent publications. And um, ultimately, and I think the, the big uh, finding out of this is really long-term field scale flux data sets are critical for um, deposition model development and evaluation. And the, the longer the data set and over the uh, more uh, variable number of uh, land use types we have the data, I think the better we can uh, develop these models and the better we can constrain our uh, chemical transport models as far as like deposition and um, for applications to critical loads and, and, and things like that. So that's all I have. <laughs> Questions, comments? We're all ready to leave. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jesse. Oh, 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 so, <laughs> right in front of me. <laughs> Okay, thanks, Jesse. It's really exciting to see your results from ACME. I know that that requires a lot of perseverance and coordination, and I appreciate all of your efforts to pull that together. Um, 
<clears throat> I was really interested that, you know, it seemed in the beginning you showed there didn't seem to be a soil moisture dependence, and you mm -hmm. that's consistent mm -hmm. with past literature. Um, but then, uh, you know, also your optimized parameterization shows that there's like a larger contribution from the soil, and, and also at the end, um, that it seems like we need more constraints seemingly associated with arid ecosystems. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and so I was wondering if you have any thoughts on, you know, what sort of si soil processes, you know, might be missing or like what specifically like we might need to, to look at in order to improve that parameterization. It's kind of an open-ended and possibly yeah. <laughs> hard question. <laughs> So um, th that is a good question. So I'm not I'm not sure exactly what's missing. I, I would say in these data sets, these were excellent data sets. There was a lot of data um, in them. It would have been really helpful if all the data sets had like not all the data sets had say latent heat flux, which would be really useful for evaluating this to model resistance. And not all of them had a very good characterization of the canopy, like uh, leaf wetness, um, LAI, and, and things like that. And very few of them had a good characterization of soil properties. So um, yeah, it's, it's a good question, and I, I don't know. I think if we had, <laughs> you know, if we had better soil data, I think that would be helpful. One mm -hmm. thing that I wonder about with arid ecosystems, if things like soil knocks, mm -hmm. particularly after like precipitation events, mm -hmm. uh, might drive like a chemical divergence in the flux. Um, but we, I, we just, I, I, I haven't seen that data. No I don't idea. know if they exist. <laughs> but, nice. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I just have one thing before we. All right. Um, I hate to be that guy to make it longer, but just for inclusion, I just have one comment from, from the chat um, from Kubir Banwait. General questions for CL scientific community. What about ozone damage to crops and their respective yield? Is anybody in ND, NADP community looking at food and economic impacts of ozone damage to crop plants? So I don't know if we need a big discussion at this point of the day, but um, I wanted to get his comment out. And if you have anything, um, definitely you can, you know, touch base with Kubir and, and, and comment. So. Thanks. Before I leave, I want to take an opportunity to, to thank everybody for coming. Um, this is always a great time for me to get away from BLM, Wyoming, and Cheyenne and all that good stuff. But I think for putting together one whale the last two days, we need to applaud Linda Geyser. This has been fantastic. <laughs> <laughs>